What's up, Storyteller? I'm Clark Rowenson, the Magic Engineer, and it's time to talk about magic. In this video, I'm going to be talking about one of the topics I actually covered in one of my live streams. So the format may be a little bit different than you're used to. I sure hope you still enjoy the content, and we're going to jump over to that right now. The next topic, what I want to talk about here is editing a magic system. And again, some caveats on what that means when, um, when I'm talking about editing a magic system, I'm not talking about iteration. Uh, iteration is the process of going back to discovery and refinement and all of that kind of stuff. This is what happens as you are developing and before anything is really polished and re anything is really finalized. When I'm talking about editing, there is something in place that is, uh, limiting how much freedom you have to add, create, and change. That could be any number of things. It could be that the magic is an essential part of your character's identity. So that's a piece of the magic that you can't really change anymore. That needs to be there in that fashion, or you need a new character, or you need to find a new way to make that character feel that thing. Most commonly, I think people are going to run into this when they have a book published. So if you have a book out or a series out, or you've been doing it serially or however, there is some reason that you can't just wave your hand and change things on the fly. If you can just change things, you're still probably going through the separate stages and that's just iteration and modification. Um, editing is specifically when you, like I said, you have those things in place that are limiting your capability to freely change the scope and function of magic. That the reason that's important, that's going to shape a lot of, uh, that's going to shape the entire rest of the conversation. So I wanted to make sure that I cleared that up at the beginning. That's, that's what I'm talking about because we were talking about discovery writers. It, <laughs> this will kind of apply there. You will have more freedom and this is more general iteration, but, um, uh, because at this point, you probably have a full draft, possibly drafts of multiple books. And while you might still technically be dealing with standard iteration, I imagine that you don't want to change everything because having to reconstruct everything would mean going through an entirely new discovery process. So discovery writers are kind of in the same boat as like I am when I have a, um, uh, a book through several levels of polish, um, but not quite, but I think the, this process is going to be very much the same. So regardless of why you need to edit your magic system. Oh, another reason you might need to edit your magic system is you're looking back and you're reading what you've already published and you find some mistakes. You contradicted yourself. Um, you said that they could do something in book one and you don't want them to be able to do that in book three, because that would completely neutralize this main conflict point for what you're going through in book three. Um, whatever the reason, something needs to be changed and you need to figure it out. Uh, you need to figure out how to move, for move forward and make it all work. The first thing that you should do, and this can't be time consuming, but trust me, it is worth it. Go through what you have written and make a record of all of the ideas that you mention and every instance that the magic is used and how it is used. You don't necessarily need to record the exact chapter or anything like that. Depending on how you do your editing of your book, that might be helpful. But if we're just looking at the magic, that's not, uh, that's not essential. You just want to know person used, used the magic to do X. So book one, chapter, whatever, somebody used magic to bar the door to keep the police from getting inside. Uh, and you can provide a little bit and like, and I said they did it by conjuring a glowing bar of mana that they just jammed the door with. Just gather that information and get a list of all of this stuff. Now, once you have a list of all of your ideas, which if you've been going through brainstorming and iteration, you're going to have a lot of this stuff written down anyway. But if you're doing discovery writing, you might have made it through the entire first draft without doing any of that uh, idea collection. And now is where you need to do that idea collection. Once you have that list, all of the uh, of all of the ideas and you have a way more than you can deal with 
and you're limited in what you can move and tweak because of reasons. From there, take all of those ideas and split them into groups. So uh, the main three that I recommend, you could definitely add more, but the main three I recommend are essential, love, and other. So every idea and every use of magic, list it as essential, love, or other. Now, essential, when I say essential, that means it is pivotal to something in your story. It is pivotal to uh, the character's backstory, to their defining moment, to a character conflict between them and somebody else. Or it's pivotal to why a faction exists or why a faction is trying to do a thing. If there is an object that a faction is going to extreme lengths to procure, you need that artifact. Otherwise, the faction wouldn't be doing what they're doing. Those are all essential. Love is just the ideas that you like and, and that you really enjoy. You could potentially pull them out, but they're either they're the ones that, you, that are in there that you really want to keep. Um, they aren't essential yet, but you really want to keep them. Or ideas that you haven't found a way to work in yet, but you also really love and want to keep. Or you want to integrate them into the system as a whole. So we talked about the guards who do animal shape-shifting. Maybe the cool idea that you have that you love and didn't come up in the discovery writing is that you want there to be shifters of mythological creatures, not just mundane creatures. Don't know what you're going to do with that. That's not there yet, but that's, that's something you put in the love box. Other, those are the ones that you feel so-so about. Those are the ones that you actively like dislike. Those are the ones that are causing problems. Or if, it's, if you're looking at it, you're saying, I don't know what to do with this or this doesn't seem to fit everything else, you might want to put it in the other box. Um, because once you have that, once you have those three boxes, you can do more boxes if you want. You could divide them into character, plot, like love, like, dislike, disinterest, hate. I, I don't know, as much as you need, but those three, I think, are the most important. Um, because once you have those, you can generally ignore everything that's in the other box. Like, don't delete it because you can use that in a different system. But you can mostly ignore what's in the other box and focus on the essentials and the love box. Because essentials are what you need to make your system work around. And then the things that are in the love box are the stuff that you want to work into the system somehow. Hey, quick break. Just want to say if you are enjoying this video, please do take a second to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. It helps tremendously, and that's all I've got. So back to the content. Going to back up a little bit. After you get the list of ideas and you get your records lined out, after that, I don't know that the order you do these other things matters. I don't know how much the order you do these things matters, and I don't yet know if you even need to do all of these things. One of them is the boxes, right? Uh, you may not need to do that. I highly encourage that because it makes it easier for you to focus and deal with stuff down the line. Me personally, I would do that immediately after I create my list, but you may not have to. Uh, something I'm still working with. But another thing you could do, so you need to do this editing um, or this uh, solidify as a discovery writer. The blueprint. Magic system blueprint. Uh, there. Fill that out. And you can get the blueprint itself for free on my website. Like, you don't have to get the whole book. I, I try not to do paywalls wherever I can. I try to minimize the, the paywalls I use uh, as much as possible because there are a few things that frustrate me more. Anyway, you can get the blueprint itself, just the, the template where you can draw things out. You can download that. You can print that off. So one of the things you can do is you could fill out the blueprint for your magic system and start tweaking the variables and figure out where you want it, especially looking at the types of magic. Even if you do nothing else with the blueprint, figuring out where you want your magic to fall on that quadrant chart, immensely valuable. Immensely valuable. Because once you know that, that is going to change how you need to approach the rest of your system and how into the weeds you need to get about how things work, how much you need to worry about consistency, how cohesive things need to be, uh, how easily you can pull things out of left field, because whether it's hard or soft, 
if people know it's a soft system, they, they will be less upset by new magical stuff randomly showing up. If it's a hard system where you spent a lot of time saying, you now know everything about the system. And then you just drag in another thing. And then another thing. And then another thing. That's going to be kind of frustrating because at that point, so you told me I knew everything. Uh, and now you're just feels like you're pulling crap out of nowhere. So understanding the type of magic you want, uh, very valuable and going through the blueprint that that will help with a lot of this now um also you can just generally go through the seven stages you're probably going to be going through the seven stages anyway but doing it deliberately of uh identifying the problems you have with your magic of like i don't like x or i want it to be more y or i'm trying to find ways to make it feel like z you know just jump into idea generation see if you have a solid seed crystal bounce around to restrictions do some testing work your way through the seven stages work through just work with the other tools you have now if you are dealing with something that is already published and the essentials are truly essential and cannot be changed then you just have to treat them as true don't retcon um actually i'll, I'll get to that in a second don't just ignore it <laughs> uh Find ways to make it work. There's a great world building game that I that I really like, and uh, down the line, this is a whole side thing. I thought it might be fun to do some small group stuff if people are interested, where uh, people come in and play this game with me. It's called Microscope, and uh, the important thing about Microscope is it's a turn. You go around a circle building the world uh, and building events and building characters. The important thing about Microscope, one of the main rules is that when it is somebody else's turn, everything they say is true. Full stop. You don't get to tell them no. You don't get to tell them no uh, unless it is part of the palette that you guys did initially. Where you're like, we don't want these elements. Aside from that, if somebody says, I want this character to do the do this thing you can't say no i want them to do this thing you don't get to do that and when it comes to your turn you can't add something that contradicts what they already said that's the mentality you want to have with your essentials is your essentials are true or <laughs> they are true in a fashion what happened happened full stop you aren't trying to undo what happened ever um but you can play with you can make it so that what people think happened isn't what actually happened. So I use the magic to uh, bar the door, or I, I use the magic to I use magic to pick a lock. Right? I may think that I did it with a spell um, because that is my understanding of magic. But then we go into a whole thing where it's it it wasn't um, it wasn't what we thought. My knowledge about the magic was wrong. I had false knowledge about how it worked. I still did what I did. My understanding of how I did it and what I actually did was wrong. Um, or it, and part of that could be I may have done it through a very ineffective, circuitous, convoluted fashion where by knowing what the magic actually does, I could do it at one step instead of 20. Those are the types of things you want to do. But the stuff that is in the essential box, that happens, period. You don't want to change those. If you change those, well, if it's already published, you can't change those. If your discovery writing, and it's essential because it's pivotal to something in your story, then if you change that or remove that, you need to go back to that other thing and adjust that. If you remove the magic that was pivotal to a character decision, you need to reassess that character decision and find another way for it to make sense for them to make that same decision and for it to have the same impact. In my book, Restrictions May Apply, it has a bunch of different exercises that you can do, but one of them in particular is very useful, especially when you're working with things in the love category. The exercise is to take your favorite elements of your magic system and then add rules, limitations, countermeasures, consequences, whatever, that make your favorite thing impossible. So I want my characters to be able to fly. I love flying characters. They're going to fly. Well, now you're going to make a bunch of rules as to why they actually can't fly it's too difficult it's too dangerous the magic can't actually do it yada 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 don't worry because then the next step is you then start adding 
four patterns and more information um, or even exceptions so that your favorite thing is now just barely possible again. Because now it's rare, now it's interesting, and now there's a lot more nuance and complexity for you to explore in order for them to do this thing. And then your favorite thing is also more likely to become somebody else's favorite thing. So that's a great exercise to do that, finding other ways to work around it. Um, yeah, so in that, that's true when you're dealing with patterns, when you're dealing with whatever. You want to focus on the essentials, fit things to that, um, and then you can start adding stuff in which may, the difficulty of that is going to depend on how rational or irrational your system is. But you might end up on occasion with ideas that straight up don't fit. You can't find a way, you can't find the logic to make these things play well together. You can't figure it out. Options. Let's talk options. <laughs> it could be a separate magic system, for one. That's, that's, always, a, that's always a potentiality. You could fabricate connections. It's something I've talked about before where the connection is just sensory or superficial and not actually mechanical or logical. Um, it's just like, hey, so they do this thing and it's connected by this sensation that happens and that's why it's part of the same system. Don't worry about the rest. Um, that's, that's one of the options that you have. The other thing is just like when you need to fix a problem, Again, this is where false knowledge can come in, can come in. Maybe one of the rules that you have is wrong and the characters don't know it's wrong and they don't know how it's wrong. And maybe you don't even know how it's wrong. That's fine. <laughs> um, it just, especially if you hang a lantern on it where people are like, well, you say that magic works this way, but what about this thing? Why does that do that? And then everybody looks and like, yeah, we don't know. Um, yeah. We haven't figured that out. The rules work for everything else, though. That one is just a special snowflake over there. <laughs> that's that's one of the things you can do. You can find, uh, you can make it complicated and convoluted. You can also break your own rules. There can be a part of this that breaks the system, or you may have said in book one that X was impossible, and then you want it to be possible in book three. You can break your rules just when you do. The most important thing is to understand that it will be important to someone and somewhere. It may not matter because your characters, they may not care that, that they just did something that supposedly nobody can do. Somebody will care. It will be a big deal somewhere. Doesn't mean it has to make it into your story. But you need to be aware of that because that's a lot of story fodder for you to take advantage of. And that would be a shame to do that. Even if you just have it on the side um, where, you know, characters, they're sitting there saying, hey, this is impossible. And they're like, oh, what, you mean this? Uh, and like, uh, yeah, that is impossible. How'd you do that? I don't know. Let's get out of this alive and then we can deal with it. And then the side character goes off and is doing a bunch of research being like, I don't understand how your powers work. They shouldn't work this way. You don't have to spend a ton of time on it. You just showing that it has repercussions and it has ripples can be enough to make it feel real. As long as somebody is taking note that the rules were broken, that can be enough. And that's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was interesting. As always, you can leave questions in the comments below. I'm also going to leave some links in the description. So if you have some questions you want me to address in any of my live Q&As, or you have topics that you would like me to cover in these kind of live conversations, you can click those links, fill out the forms, and I will uh, potentially cover your topic in one of these future live stream slash video recordings. Thank you again, and whatever you do, make sure that you keep writing and stay awesome.